of the book, but we're going to talk about him. If you remember, we were working up and we got into the uh, bridge and labor uh, with the uh, uh, ladies' mirrors uh, that they used. I believe you. Everybody remember that? Last week, sort of like. And uh, and I did tell you that if you want to know women in the Bible and everything, it'd be good to find out everything that God says about them. I mean, you got Deborah, you got a good judge there. Apparently, they couldn't find any men to judge. Deborah was a good judge. You got uh, Hannah, got uh, future prophecy from the Lord, but she also gave birth to Samuel. And she was committed to giving that child to the Lord, and she did it. And uh, so there's a lot of things about women in there. It's not negative. It's God used them. God, duh. You know, God created them. He sort of knows that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, we're supposed to really get into, uh, I wanted to get into the, uh, uh, the priest. And uh, that's what we'll get into today before we get into the whole tabernacle. And uh, the whole tabernacle will be that whole rectangular thing there, including the sanctuary and uh, holy holies and things like this. So we ought to know about the priest. And what's interesting is uh, the garments of the priest, uh, God calls them, it says, for glory and for beauty. That's interesting. That's what God calls the clothing of the priest, for glory and uh, and for beauty. Uh, in Exodus 28, let's go to Exodus 28. <clears throat> now we'll, we'll, we're going to be talking about the priest, not uh, uh, the other priest. We're talking about the high priest. Uh, so in trying to see how far to read in this, but in Exodus 28, uh, verse 1 through 39, uh, because the rest of the chapter 28 has to do with the priest's uh, garments of the sons of those in line for the high priest. We don't, we don't particularly care about that right now. Uh, we want to deal with the garments of, that Aaron wore, which uh, pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ for glory and for beauty. Uh, they set forth the Lord Jesus Christ as well as the high priest over Israel uh, at any time. Aaron was first, and there were many uh, successors, that's for sure. Uh, we can illustrate that by uh, uh, when you think about the garment of the priest. If you go over uh, during the New Testament times, they, they knew how the Pharisees dressed, and they could see them afar off. So normally when they'd see them coming down the street or something, they'd clean up their act enough. You know, they'd do that outwardly show stuff. And the priest uh, <clears throat> would demand that, you know. And there's a lot of biblical proof that they should. They had, ought to be subservient to those people. Uh, but we know how the Pharisees are used negatively, uh, especially in this age. They claim every Christian that ever says anything about anybody doing anything bad. He's a Pharisee or whatever. Well, I don't know about all that, but I know this, that Jesus Christ said, lest your righteousness exceed that of, a, of the Pharisee. So the devil didn't put him in. God put him in. And uh, the scribes take care of the word of God. And then you had the different groups. You had the Sadducees and that, uh, that were spurs or, or roots or uh, branches off of what God said. He didn't create them. <coughs> and, um, but here with the high priest, Everybody knew who he was. They could tell by his garments. And they respected him, and they were supposed to respect him. And it's just somebody says, well, we don't respect man at any time. Well, if you go in the military, I'll tell you what, uh, even if there's a lieutenant uniform hanging up, they said they, they made them new guys from boot camp salute the uniform. They wanted to get them to understand that it's not the guy in the uniform, it's the uniform. It's what he represents. And uh, so... A lot of people will overlook that, but God's into that. God's into respect. He's into submission to authority. God is an authoritarian if you look at the Bible, but it's also how you use it. So it's always the use of anything. Over here in Exodus 28, <clears throat> we're going to get into the high priest, and the priest uh, we know is types of Christ and believers of the church age. But anyway, verse 1. 
and take thou unto the Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Elizer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, for glory, see that? For glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And all through the Old Testament and the New and, and even in the Pauline epistles, we found it, it has a lot to do with the wisdom that people have. And we find out it's not worldly wisdom. We find out that God gives them wisdom. A lot of times you'll read when you're going through school, the textbooks or whatever, and they give this, this doctor here credit for this or that. And I remember going through <clears throat> the psychology classes and all that at uh, Spring Arbor, and, and I'd stop and say, wait a minute, what if I show you that 3,000 years before this dude was even born that that, uh, that, that, that wisdom was already revealed? Oh, here we go, preacher, because it's, it's supposed to be a Wesleyan college that I was at, so I figured, you know, I go to Proverbs. I just start reading Proverbs. I say, you know, if everybody read Proverbs one a day, oh, it's better than a vitamin. You know, you know, there's some simple people. There's some fools in there. There's some, there's some wise sons. And if you look, it's, it's the Lord gives you wisdom, real wisdom. Not as the world gives you wisdom. And uh, so as we're seeing here, did you notice that? That God said those would understand that had wisdom. He gives the wisdom. He gives the spirit of wisdom. A lot of things that were good that were passed down, we call wives' tales sometimes or, or, or basically common sense. And that's what the world lacks today. And that hasn't been passed down. So somebody skipped it. Some granddaddy skipped telling his grandkid or something. Because these people, man, it's just some... Anyway, <clears throat> I don't want to get off on that. We'd be uh, Fox Network. So just so you understand that um, these are holy garments because God said they're holy. And holy just means sanctified, means set apart. So when God called you holy when he saved you, that means you are set apart. Somebody says, well, you think you're holier than thou. Well, I'm just as holy as God thinks I'm holy. He set me apart. But now if I act arrogantly, that's a whole other ballgame. See, it's the, it's the way we act, what we are, determines how the world sees us. But if you're just walking around telling, hey, man, that's wrong, and you know the Bible says it's wrong, you know it's wrong, and they look at you and start saying you're holier than thou, then say, duh, you know, not holier than thou, but I know I'm holier than you if you're doing that junk, you know. And people are backing off because of political correctness. And Trump's definitely stirring that up, so amen for that. <clears throat> so verse 4 And these are the garments which they shall make a breastplate and an ephod and a robe and a broidered coat, a miter, that's the hat, and a girdle. And they shall make holy garments for Aaron, thy brother, and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is upon it, shall be of the same, according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, of purple, scarlet, and fine twine linen. And thou shalt take two onk stones, engrave on them the name of the children of Israel. Six of their names on one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth. Wow. <clears throat> And we know that the 12 tribes go with the 12 sons. 
and you go all the way back to Reuben and you go down, you count 12, and that's what he's talking about, their birth. So it's not just a tribe, it's who the head of the tribe was. And that means that's the son of Jacob, one of the sons. There's 12 of them. And God wanted them in order. God's a stickler like that, if you, if you read the Bible. And from the firstborn down, and um, verse 11. With the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravers of a signet, shalt thou engrave the two stones with the names of the children of Israel. Thou shalt make them to be set in ounces of gold. In other words, that's what's going to hold them stones, them ounces or ouches. <coughs> We're going to be made out of gold holding those stones. And thou shalt put the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for the stones of memorial unto the children of Israel, and Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. So the high priest has the burden of the nation of Israel. They're upon his shoulders. See, everything's significant. God's put them in certain places for certain reasons. And then he says, bear. So you know that the high priest now is responsible, in a sense, to God to do what he's supposed to do for the nation of Israel. And once a year, that atonement's going to be made. But his outfit, his outfit had to be perfectly done, like God said it. And there were skilled people, craftsmen, that would do that because he gave them wisdom to be able to stitch this and do this, the embroidering. You're talking about gold. They can, gold is very soft. Uh, I don't know everything that, that he did. This one up here is sort of, <clears throat> sort of in color. And uh, you can see the colors, and you know that the flag of the Jew is blue, right? It's significant. So here's the ephod right here. You see that? See these up here? Those are the uh, the twelve tribes. Six on this shoulder, six on the other, and they're they're you have to get up and see it, but they're gold ouches or things that are, are sewn into this garment to hold those stones. The E five now is going to have twelve stones, and um, he's going to bear those twelve stones. And there's a mystery with this E5. There's a lot of like Indiana Jones stuff, okay? Have you ever saw Indiana Jones, you know, and all this uh anyway. But the Bible, the Bible is clear about this, this stuff. Uh God said that the firmament shows his handiwork, right? Remember that in the Psalms? He says that the stars speak. There's a language. And it's amazing that all of us today, we're well aware of the zodiac sign. Now in navigation, fantastic. It's real. Because there's what, 12 constellations? Now I'm just throwing this out. I always do this to you, but I just want you to think. There are 12 constellations. You know that, right? If you didn't, look it up. And when they navigate, they would say Sagittarius, you know, here's Virgo. I mean, this was something they didn't worship. It was for navigation at the beginning. You know, God told them that there was a language. And somebody was smart enough to study the sky and find out there is a language. They knew exactly by those 12 constellations, seasons, how to navigate. It's a wonder. And what does man do? He takes them and he worships them. He goes to the newspaper and says, I wonder what Virgo's doing today. Every time I read that junk, it was not right. It's almost like a Chinese fortune cookie. But I guess if you got up in the morning, you read it like six days or something, and it was all correct every six days. And you say, wow, there's something to this. Yeah, the devil gets his hand on it. There's a whole lot to it. When you start worshiping the stars, you got a problem. But if you use them like God said to use them, there's a lot of good secrets to that stuff. And as you, <clears throat> if you've never studied your Bible about what happens to the church, 
what happens with the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ that's going to happen on planet earth yes it is literal Jesus Christ and the church is going to be with them right ruling and reigning well the Jews are going to have their property everything that Aaron stepped on you know that big old triangle in that uh, eastern area everywhere uh, Abraham put his foot God gave it to him that was the covenant God made with Abraham. One thousand year reign, they're going to have that. And I'm looking around, so I know you heard these sermons or you, you read your Bible enough to know <clears throat> that the first thing that them disciples wanted to know is who's going to rule and reign with you, Lord. The Lord didn't deny it. Number one, he did, it. he did say, I must increase, you must decrease. Remember John the Baptist said that? But he also said, you'll have you'll be sitting on seats on thrones and lo and behold when you start reading Revelation you found that there's 12 and where are they going to be located Jerusalem and who's going to be on it I believe the Jewish disciples they're going to be on each one doing what judging judging the Bible says they're going to judge and people that come into Jerusalem will bring gifts to the Jew in other words, everything now that we hear about how bad the Jews are, we've got to get rid of the Jews, da 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 da, it's totally reversed when the Lord's in charge. They will bring all their gifts and everything into that Jew. Do you understand that? Okay. When that's, and, and the reason they can do all that and everything's okay is number one, Jesus is ruling with an iron rod. That's what he said. And in order to have an iron rod, means there's got to be Adamic nature. What is that? That's your nature right now that you're trapped in. That's that sinful sucker that, that goes all the way back to the garden, right? But now you have a greater force than that inside. You've got a new creature, a new creation. That's your new person. That's the power to control this thing out here. So when you surrender to it, this listens. When you surrender to this, Holy Spirit's grieved and he just quiet. Stuff happens. But during the millennium, we've got to change body. Because when we see him, we're going to be like it. This vile body's changed, man. We're like the Lord. We're not affected by that. But the people that come through the tribulation period are still living. They're still having babies. They've still, they still got the Adamic nature. So that thousand-year reign will be controlled by the Lord and his servants. There's not going to be nobody messing up. Because the devil's taken and tossed in the pit and chained up for them thousand years. So nobody's, nobody's bothering anybody, mentally, that is. So <clears throat> when this is over, though, and that devil's loosed, and he cons all these people to come again, then the Lord immediately takes care of them. They are just vaporized. And then the Bible says that he who sits on the throne, the heavens blown away. Now we're getting ready for the white throne judgment. And that's where the expression goes, out of the firing pan, into the fire. Those that are in hell and those coming out of that uh, millennial rule are going to be judged now by their works before Almighty God. Not us. We, we did the right thing. We accepted that, that gift of salvation from the Lord. But all these, well, when that's done, you know what happens? There's a new heaven. Why? Because the other one was polluted by the devil. And there's a new earth. Why? Just like leprosy. This thing's bur getting burnt up. No more of this stuff. So there's new heavens, new earth. So the original creation, without the flaw of Adam, is now present. The people that will be populating it, People aren't taught this. It's in the Bible. They're going to populate it. Are going to be going out into what? Twelve constellations. And they're going to be under one of them stones. You got a birth stone? What's your birth stone? There's nothing new under the sun. If you find out, it's going to come back to this book. If it's right and it's lasting, and if you want to look at all the mythology and stuff like this, there's sometimes there's a lot of truth mixed with that. 
but you find truth in here. So if you can actually trace it in here and you're not making this stuff up, then that's, that encourages you when you look at this. Because, I mean, God is from, he's got no start. He's always been. And he's allowed us to be in his family. And this study here is just showing us way back God is showing you who the Lord Jesus Christ is. God is showing you that in the sacrifice. He's showing you that in the high priest as he's going to intercess for the nation. Jesus Christ intercesses for us. I mean, everything in type is perfect to this tabernacle. As a matter of fact, this tabernacle is a pattern, according to the book of Hebrews, that was given to Moses from heaven. That there's in the third heaven, there is a tabernacle. It's interesting stuff, I think. And uh, so anyway, we're getting back to his garments. Amen. Now that's the ephod, the pure work. And uh, also verse 15, the breastplate, plate itself. And thou shalt make the breastplate a judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it of gold, of blue, purple, Scarlet and a fine twine linen shalt thou make it. Four square it shall be being doubled. A span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And uh, when, you, when you look at that, a span is usually about almost nine inches, and uh, usually from here to here, the hand. And uh, so makes sense, squared, all nines, the Bible considers that number nine as fruitfulness, but it's, I think it's actually 8.737. How do you know it? Because I'm looking at it in my center and reference Bible, if they're right. <coughs> but it's squared. And thou shalt set in its settings of stones, even four rolls of stones. First roll shall be a sardis, a topaz, carbuncle. Uh, this shall be the first roll. And the second roll shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and diamond. And the third row, a, a ligure, an agate, and an amethyst. And the fourth row, a beryl, an ox, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosures. And the stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, 12, according to their names. Like the engravings of a signet. That signet is like a ring, a king's ring. When you go down, you, you can seal things. So it's engraved like that. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate chains at the end of the wreathen work of pure gold. And thou shalt make upon the breastplate two rings of gold, and shalt put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And thou shalt put the two uh, wreathen chains of gold in the two rings which are in the ends of the breastplate. And the other two ends of the two wreaths, chains, thou shalt fasten in the two ouches and put them on the shoulder pieces of the ephed before it. And thou shalt make two rings of gold and thou shalt put them upon the two ends of the breastplate in the border thereof, which is in the side of the ephod inward. And the two other rings of gold, isn't this interesting? Isn't this holding your attention? Isn't that something like looking at an architect blueprint? You have to love it, right? <clears throat> 27. Again. And two other rings of gold thou shalt make, and shalt put them on the two sides of the ephod underneath, toward the uh, forepart thereof, over against the other coupling thereof, above the curious girdle of the ephod. And they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof onto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of what? Judgment upon his heart, when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. So if you went through here and you saw the square plate like, you know, like this, and then the other ones with the stones that go on top, what we just read there is how God is telling them how to fasten it so things don't get loose, how to, how to fasten little rings and the, and the golden chains. 
all the way to the shoulders where the other uh, ouches are so that it doesn't get out of center. I mean, what he's doing is he's in detail, he's telling them exactly what to do and how it's done, and it better be done that way. He's not going to accept anything less than that. God will not. And, uh, and he mentions how it's judgment. And that judgment takes place when Aaron goes into the Holy of Holies. And then we got the Urim and the Thummim and uh, <coughs> breastplate again. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. And what that means is, uh, if you put the two words together, it means lights and perfections. Now some, according to my notes, some make these uh, to be simply a collective name for the stones of the breastplate so that the total effect of the 12 stones is to manifest the lights and perfections of whom uh, uh, is the antitype of the Aaronic high priest. Uh, this would seem to be conclusive that the Urim and Thummim are additional to the stones of the breastplate. Uh, in use, these two were connected in some way, not clearly expressed with the ascertainment of the divine will in particular cases, and we won't go to those particular cases, but they're in Numbers and Deuteronomy. In your own personal study, when you look at the, those words, Urim and Thummim, you can look it up in the back of your Bible, you can look at the verses, and there's something that happens with these things illuminating. Something connected with God in these things and involves the 12 uh, tribes. And what I mean is it's like if, say, for instance, the priest was here and you were looking at him and he was talking and God got into that thing, this whole thing would be bright. And that's where you're getting your UFOs, you're getting all this stuff. I mean, people have made, you go to Discovery Station, you'd be, they go right to that Bible, and they go right to those things, and then they try to explain them, being lost people. And some of them guys get pretty close to what's happening, but whenever they're close, it's because they got Scripture. And here we're saved, and I don't know about all that stuff, but I know that if I did a word study and I found out that these things got bright, then I would say, well, Whenever it says they're bright, God in, is, the, is in the presence. So there's something between those, that Urim and Thurim, that's connected to the gold, you know, conductor electricity, right? And then those stones, crystals. And that's where they get like, uh, how do you think we got our radios going? Do you know what they used to use? Crystals. Right? There's a lot of stuff in this Bible, I'm telling you. And uh, just so you understand, that as we're reading here, it can get exciting. If you, if you go through the verse, you're going to say, man that's, man, that's some kind of deal going on. I mean, that's way before they had cars and everything and computers and stuff, as far as we know. <clears throat> so that uh, Urim and Thurim is to be placed on there. And uh, for Aaron, when he goes in, and it's very important that all these things be put together properly. Verse 31 says, we get into the robe. And thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. And when it says the robe of the ephod, that means what the ephod is going to rest on. See how it's resting on that? See this robe? It's over that garment, the linen garment. And it's almost like a little poncho here where the shoulders are made. But you see the garment underneath. And all this stuff's got to be perfectly done. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want any idea of this perfection, you could get to the unknown soldiers and look up those guys that uh, have volunteered, not volunteered, but have been picked for that guard duty and go through their rigorous training. As a matter of fact, they cannot drink or smoke the rest of their life. A lot of people don't understand those guards. I mean, we're talking about perfection. Everything's got to be perfect. They're inspected before they even get out there with their weapon. And their character, that's their inside, has to match. Or they're kicked off. 
and uh, very few make that position. And that's us, that's humanly speaking. So that robe's made and uh, it's, it's of blue and there shall be a hole in the top of it in the midst thereof. It shall have a binding of woven work round about the whole of it as it were the whole of a, a hebergen that it be not rent. In other words, you can't rent it in twain because of that broider that's going around it, this whole part, you know. <clears throat> and beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof and bells of gold between them round about. Now, this is just a fellow named Josephus that has a history, a little bit of history of the Jew. He's saying the reason the bells are down there are because that priest, when he's going into Holy Holies, he's swishing back and forth when he walks, and you can hear them bells. And when the bells stop, they say there was a rope tied to his ankle to pull him out because God didn't accept the sacrifice. There was sin in the camp, wasn't taken care of. That's, man, that's scary being a priest, I'll tell you that now, if that's true. Now, the part about the rope and everything, I can't trace that to Scripture, but I can get the bells here. It could be making a joyful noise to the Lord. Who knows? But uh, nonetheless, the bottom of it, down here, there's bells. making ringing noises <clears throat> as he enters in. And, uh, hmm. okay, verse uh, 35. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and uh, his sound shall be heard, that's where it's right there, when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he cometh out, that he what? So I guess it does make sense what he's saying about the rope. Because if there's no sound, God says he dies. Wow. Did you know everything that we read, that if somebody didn't make it just like that, you know what happened to them? They died. People miss all that. That's why they, they don't like the Old Testament at all. They say, man, God is mean. That's under the law. When you're done reading all this stuff, you thank God that there's no more high priest. There's only one now. He made that sacrifice for us. It's amazing grace for sure. We don't have to worry about anything happening to him. He is forever. And he makes intercession for us. And then we find out all this other stuff that happens to the children of Israel when they, they, uh, they're in the wilderness and they disobey. We find out what God does to all them people. And we think about ourselves, and you've got to think about the grace and mercy of God. Because, see, if we were back in that time, we'd been, I'd have been dead at five years old. You know, if an elder sees an unruly kid dishonoring the parents, he brings that kid before him, before the, before the uh, uh, consul. And if the parents, you know, beg or whatever they do, then per eventually they give them mercy. They didn't put up with that. And then if somebody went and picked up sticks on Saturday, the Sabbath, never guess. They'll find them there Sunday morning. You know, our Sunday, right, is not first day of the week like their Sunday. Their Sunday is the first day get back to normal. But if you look at the Sabbath ordinance and somebody went out there to pick up sticks, even just for a little fire because they're freezing to death in the wilderness, they'd find them there on Sunday because <laughs> nobody could take them because that'd be work. Yeah, I mean, Gentiles are stupid sometimes. We ought to look at the, if you go over there, I'm telling you, elevator time, airplanes landed in certain airports over in Tel Aviv because of the Zionists and that, the, the law keepers, you just can't do stuff. You go over there and it's bizarre. Americans think they can just go hop around on the Sabbath and do this and that, and they find out, whoa, there's only certain places. Usually it's Arabs because they don't, they don't uh, keep the Sabbath, that Sabbath. And, uh, and all I can see when I study this stuff is I thank God, man, I'm saved. I'm thank God I found out about this. This is something else. That God would make it me his child. I know who I am. I'm talking about the works of righteousness, that, which we have done. 
Anyway, let's, uh, we got to get to the crown. Okay. Verse 36. And thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, engrave upon it like the engravings of a signet. Look what it says. Holiness to the Lord. All capitals. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the mitre, upon the forefront of the mitre it shall be. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear, look what it says, the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hollow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always upon his forehead, that they may be accepted before the Lord. So now you're seeing the representation of this high priest, that that's got to be on his forehead all the time. And God recognizes the protection of all them people. Because Aaron, Aaron represents the nation of Israel. One man. And what he does is going to be, uh, is going to, it's going to eventually, uh, if he disobeys God, it's going to result in a whole lot of, people dying and different things taking place, diseases and everything, with the nation of Israel. So Aaron had to stay consecrated, so I had to stay holy before the Lord. Just so you can get that picture. And verse 38 again, let's see. And it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hollow in all their holy gifts and it shall be always upon his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Verse 39, we'll close there because the, uh, we're not going to get into son's clothing. And thou shalt embroider the coat of fine linen, and thou shalt make the mitre of fine linen, and thou shalt make the girdle of needle work. So that's the thing around here. Holds everything. It's his hat is his mitre. And uh, that's beauty unto the Lord. Uh, so the garments made Aaron recognizable for the people, easy to recognize at a distance. Uh, they could prepare themselves for the meeting of the high priest. Each part of these garments point uh, the Lord Je to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we know that. We looked at Exodus 28, verses 1 and 2, uh, where it talks about, and take thou Unto thee, Aaron, thy brother, and his sons with him, from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And it goes through his kids that he took. And, uh, and, and it ends with uh, glory and for beauty. Uh, that's the garments. That's the purpose and the name of the garments, for the glory of God and for his beauty. And now in verse 1, we see God talking with Moses. Uh, Aaron was Moses' brother, and Aaron was to be consecrated in the priest's office. Following him was his sons, and uh, Nadab, uh, who we have here, Nadab, Bihu, Elizer, and Ithamar. And you'll recall that in Leviticus 9, we find Nadab and Abihu were slain by God for offering strange fire unto the Lord. They were made a breach showing, uh, I believe, the importance of being in the priest's office. God didn't play games with them two. They were not supposed to. <laughs> when it says strange fire, if you remember, I think, I think with Samuel, um, they, let the, uh, they let the fire go out in the sanctuary. That was a bad thing. That's when the presence of the Lord was leaving Israel, and uh, somebody got the Ark of the Covenant, if you remember, went to the Philistines. And that's where on their way back, um, the fellow touched it. Instead of carrying it like God told him, they killed him. Um, and everybody was a little upset over that, wondering why God would do that. And then David knew. See, he wanted the presence of God back too quick. And he would do anything to get it back, and they put it on a new cart. And uh, instead of carrying it with staffs. Why was that important? Because God told everyone, when we start studying this, exactly how things are made, put together, and how they travel, how they travel. 
And the Old Testament shows you that God doesn't put up with anything less than that. And so these two sons of Aaron <laughs> decided to make strange fire. Hey, ain't nobody going to catch us. Nobody's going to watch. See, if you don't make it like God told you to make it with the coals off the brazen altar and taken, and you try it another way, God didn't give him a break is what I'm telling you. There's no probation period. You read this Old Testament, if that doesn't strike you a little bit, it should. When you're reading all the way through there, instead of you getting down in God and thinking God's mean and all this stuff, you better thank God Jesus came. The real Messiah was here. But he's also the high priest. He performed all the offices, right? Prophet, king, priest. And uh, you need to remember that and keep that in there because it helps you under, it, it helps you it helps you appreciate your own salvation. Or if you get too holy in your head, you know, you think you, you've made it or something. It ought to knock you down a few notches. Because I'm telling you, what a thing. Now, <clears throat> you think about uh, the Bible says in that verse that we read that he may minister. It says that again in verses 3 and 4 of what we read. Aaron was recognized as a high priest. But it took all of them to carry on the priest's office. In other words, Aaron could not have done it all by himself. Aaron could not typify the Lord Jesus Christ all by himself. No man, no man. So it took all of them, just as in the sacrifices. It took several sacrifices to set forth the work Christ did when he was, when he was here on the earth and while on the cross. Um, we refer to him being on the earth as the meat offering, which has no blood sacrifice there. In other words, when he was walking around, people were taken from him. Why would you say meat? It was the bread. And what's the bread? He's the bread of life. It says, take, eat of me. Remember that? And the Catholics go nuts and they make a holy Eucharist, and now you're, you're a cannibal, right? Eating cookies. Anyway, I want to get down to religion. That wouldn't be politically correct. Amen but we just don't do that. I come from that background. We don't eat the body of Christ literally, and I don't drink his blood, I'm not a Dracula. That was all in remembrance of him, thinking back what he did for us with his body and his blood. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Yes, we don't kill the Lord afresh and anew every Sunday. Sorry, happened once for all, period. These are the things that the Inquisition killed a whole lot of people over. We're supposed to be smarter now, but it seems like we're getting dumber and we're going back. History's repeating its place, right? Because you can, you can believe this. When the Antichrist gets there, Antichrist, against Christ, against the thought of Christ. He'll get everybody with a common God, common belief. Everybody wants to do good. He'll, he'll give them uh, things to do that are good. Turn in all the Christians is a good thing. That claim to be Christians. But if they're real Christians, they get along with everybody. They love everybody. You know, wouldn't judge anybody. Because surely Jesus didn't judge nobody. You know, you hear this, man. That's what happens when you get a hold of that Bible and you believe that Bible is the very word of God and you start studying that Bible, it messes you up with the world. You just don't see things the same. I mean, you watch the news and you're saying, where are they getting this? What is wrong with these people? And yet you go out in the workplace and you'll see these people and they'll say, oh, yeah, yeah. Where's their brain at? Well, thank God you got a brain. You're thinking right. He's the God of this world. I mean, time is only but, you know, 70, maybe 120 years old if you can last that long, you know. And then you're going to eternity. There's no time. God doesn't wear a watch. Our history evolves in time. God had to set that time. And it's between Genesis and Revelations. That's the history of man. So we're seeing all these Ill, little intricate uh, things. And in the book I'm studying, it doesn't have any color. This has color, though. You can actually get up here and actually see what we were talking about. This is the miter, right? So you can see the embroidery. They did a very good job. The blue, uh, the contrast, the colors. Uh, the ephod here, and it's on a gold plate, right? New Orleans Brown, remember, is over there? And uh, might be something to that. 
you know, conductor of electricity, crystals. I mean, I don't know about all that, but stuff happens. And so the scientists, when they go to that and they read that and they look at that, they say, this could very well be this. And they look at all their different uh, uh, electrical devices that they have and they found, oh, look at all that gold, best conductor there is. Platinum's good too. Gold though, wow. I used to uh, freak out a little bit with uh, being a millwright, the electrician, it's amazing how them electricians, I'm telling you, most of them are drunks. I mean, seriously. You know, I, I, when I was in the workforce for all those years, I'm thinking back, I'm saying, there was only one guy I knew, and he was a Christian that didn't drink like that. The guy that I worked at Hercules Drawn Still them years, a fifth at lunch of whiskey. And man, I got a couple gold rings. His hands were loaded with gold. I mean, he made money. That guy made some money. And he'd work around 10,000 watts and everything. I'm saying to myself, wow, put your hands around there. You're a walking electro. I mean, you, man, you know. Because we know and they know basic electricity. You, gotta, you don't want anything that's going to conduct electricity on your body. There are some of those boxes, Brother Super probably knows those huge things, that if you walk between them, you can con you'll be the ground. You, you'd die on some of them racks up there in those plants without electricity. So there's something about electricity, there's something about the devil as lightning falling from heaven. There's some connection with him because he's the prince and the power of the air. That's what God says. That means the airwaves. So who knows, maybe something with this. I'm not gonna get into that. Maybe I'll have to get into UFOs one day, but when you think about this priest, something took place and the children of Israel knew something took place. It was evident. And uh, so when we go through these garments, the main thing to remember, though, is it's all a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking forward to that last high priest, right? Last sacrifice. And we know that because we're saved now. We can look back and we can read this stuff. So, man, let's take a break. Much learning to make the man.